Let's go to God's word. Let's open up to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I want to commend you for uh, coming through some hard messages over the last few weeks. We have dealt with some difficult topics in Matthew chapter 10 as we have heard Jesus commission the disciples and tell them that their work, their ministry is going to be difficult. It is going to be challenging. It is going to be met with opposition. And we've said over the last few Sundays that this is the reality of the Christian life. It is hard. It is difficult. We face hostility. We face opposition. We face persecution. And at times, the Christian life is more difficult than it is easy. In fact, being a believer can divide families. It can divide the very core, the most basic building block of society. The relationships that we hold most dear can be quickly and easily divided because of Christ. The the stand that believers take for the gospel will at times put them at odds with those who are in their families. And so being a believer is not easy. It is a costly endeavor. And Jesus has been preparing the disciples for this. You remember back in Matthew chapter 10, he's given them instructions on where they are to go, what they are to say, who they are to visit, who they are to minister to, where they are to engage in their ministry. That's the first part of Matthew chapter 10. Then he told them what to expect. He told them it was going to be a hard road, that they would face opposition, they would face hostility, that it would be a difficult task, a weighty task. There there would be those who would challenge them and those who will demonstrate bitter opposition to them. This is what they were going to expect. This is what they were going to experience. In fact, if you look in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 10, brother would even betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. This is such a significant opposition that in some cases, Jesus says there will be division in the home. This is what you need to expect. And because of that, Jesus recognized that there would be temptations to fear. There would be temptation to become afraid. And so he's preparing them for that in verse 26 and verse 28 and verse 30 and 31. He's talking about the fact that there's going to be difficulty and opposition and you're going to be tempted to be afraid. But he calms that. He says, you don't need to be fearful The Lord will watch over you. The Lord will care for you. The Lord will sustain you. And so in the midst of all of this, there is great encouragement. There is great hope that the the Lord Jesus Christ will sustain those who, when they face opposition, are tempted to fear. So that's what we've been seeing here in Matthew chapter 10, but it's not the whole story. There's actually some encouraging things that come here at the very last part of this chapter. And Jesus wants the disciples to know, and he wants us to know, that there are great things that are associated with us being his ambassadors. There are blessings, there are encouragements. In reality, he wants them to understand that they bear his name. And they carry his authority. In fact, he wants them to understand that they're identified with him. He's identified with them, and they're identified with him. That's the joy, that's the privilege that comes with being a disciple of Christ. You can be his ambassador, you can be his representative, and you can have the knowledge, and you can have the the realization that you are truly identified with Jesus Christ, and he identifies himself with you. There's blessings for those who take that message into the world, and there are blessings for those who receive God's messengers into their home and into their world and care for them and love them. And this is what Jesus gets at. Right at the end of Matthew chapter 10, he wants them to know there's some blessings in the midst of all of this hard. 
There's some good things. Do you know that? When the Christian life gets really hard and you're facing hostility and you're facing opposition and you're facing a world that that doesn't want to hear of Christ and doesn't want to hear the truth, where do you go for comfort? Where do you go for strength? Where do you go for encouragement? How do you continue to labor on in the face of opposition and hostility? What comforts your soul? What encourages your heart? What enables you to carry on and faithfully serve the Lord even when there is opposition and hostility? What do you do? Where do you turn? It's a question you all have to wrestle with. It's a question I have to wrestle with as well as we face intense opposition from a world that hates Christ and hates his word. Right at the end of this charge, Jesus encourages his disciples. It's in verses 40 to 42. I would invite you to follow along as I read those three verses. Jesus says, he who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his Reward. Where do you turn when the world turns on you? What do you do when the world unleashes its hostility against you? I want to show you that this morning. I'll give you two profound realities that bring comfort in the midst of opposition. Two profound realities realities that bring the disciples of Christ comfort in the midst of their opposition. Number one, here's the first profound reality. It is that believers are identified with Christ. Believers are identified with Christ. The first thing that Jesus wants the disciples to know is that he identifies with them and they are identified with him. There's a solidarity between Jesus and the disciples and between Jesus and us. Identity. We have a world that's living in an identity crisis. We have a world that doesn't know who they are because they're not in Christ. And when you're not in Christ, you have all kinds of questions about your identity, who you are. And and there's confusion and there's all kinds of uh, questions that swirl around who you are. And, And you heard Stephen even say it in the mission moment. There's questions today about many as they question their identity, their gender identity. What's our identity as Christians What defines us? And it is here, as we learn in verse 40, that we are identified with Christ, and Christ is identified with us. Notice what he says. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. After giving the disciples a long charge that they're going to have to face opposition. He wants them to know, listen, I'm with you. I'm identified with you. And however they treat you is how they want to treat me. There's this union that you have with me that that enables me to identify myself with you. So he's anticipating the fact that you're going to meet with people who are going to welcome you into their Homes. They're going to extend their hearts to you. They're going to extend their ministry to you. They're going to receive you. Go about up to chapter 10, verse 11. Remember, we hinted at this up in verse 11. Jesus told them there, whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. And if the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. 
He says, there's going to be people when you go out into this world. Remember, he's sending them on a solo mission. As they go out, as they head into their mission field, Jesus says, there's going to be people who welcome you. They're going to receive you. They're going to hear your message, and they're going to embrace you, and they're going to welcome you into their homes and into their lives. Those are the people that, that you stay with. Those are the people that you, you uh, plant yourself in for a time until you go on to the next place. So here's what would likely happen. They would go into a city. They would be preaching the gospel. They would enter a synagogue, and there would be people who would hear what they were saying, and they would say, that's true. That's right. They're not only embracing the messenger, they're embracing the message. As opposed to look at verses 14 and 15 of the same chapter, he, he refers to those who will not do that. He says in verse 14, whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that city or that house, shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. On the opposite side, there are going to be people who reject you. But there will be people who receive you. And here in verse 40, go back to verse 40 of our text this morning, Jesus teaches them an incredible lesson. He wants them to understand that those who receive them are actually receiving Christ and the Father. Notice what he says again in verse 40. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Imagine the encouragement here. Imagine the encouragement to these disciples as they head out into the mission field. Jesus is telling them, listen, there's going to be people who receive you. And you need to understand that as they receive you, they're actually receiving me. And not only are they receiving me, they're receiving the Father who sent me. You see the stamp of approval upon their ministries? You go. You serve. You preach. You proclaim, and some will say, that's true. Tell me more. And you can have the absolute confidence that those people are not only accepting your ministry, they're accepting your message, and not only are they are accepting your message, they're accepting me as their Savior, and not only accepting me, they're accepting the Father as well. What an encouragement. What an incredible verification and confirmation of the fact that their ministry is an actual representation of Christ and of the Father. Why? Because he's identified with us. He, he's one with us. We're one with him. There's a solidarity between God and his people, between Christ and his disciples. He lives in them. He's with them. So whatever you do to his servants, you're doing to him. However you respond to Christ's people is how you respond to Christ. Listen to Matthew 18, verse 5. He says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. To receive a a child of God is to receive Christ. Luke 10, verse 16, the one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Whatever you do with God's people is what you do with Christ. You receive him, you receive them, you receive Christ. You receive the messengers of God's people, then you receive the Father himself. You reject him, you're rejecting Christ. You reject the messengers, you're rejecting Christ. These disciples are ambassadors. Think for a moment about what an ambassador is. Our U.S. country has ambassadors to all kinds of countries around the world. And those ambassadors represent our country. They represent our government. They represent our nation. 
And however a country treats the ambassador of the U.S. is how they treat our country, what they think of our country. Just, just think of the parallels here. If, if, if a, an ambassador of the U.S. were to go to, let's say, Germany, and Germany doesn't receive them, they don't like our country. If an ambassador were to go to Germany and they are warmly received and a banquet is thrown and, and their arms are thrown wide open and the country receives the ambassador, they're receiving the country who sent them. That's the idea. There's an identity there. And so Jesus is saying, however you are treated is a statement about me. However you treat God's people is a statement of how you treat Christ because there's a unity, there's a solidarity, there's a oneness, there's a close identification between Father, Son, and disciples so that how you treat His messengers, how you treat His people is how you treat Christ. Let me give you two illustrations on how we know this is true. One on a corporate level, one on an individual level. You remember we said before, Paul, before he was converted, was Saul. And he was on the road to Damascus. He was on his way to murder Christians. And you remember what happened? God arrested him there. Christ arrested him there, gained his attention. And you remember what he said? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's on his way to murder Christians. He's on his way to persecute Christians. He's on his way to show hostility toward Christians. And Jesus says, wait, Paul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? There's solidarity. How you treat the people of God is how you treat Christ. That's in a corporate example. Let me give you one individual example. That being Colossians 1, 24. Paul, now converted, says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Paul's saying, there are people who are trying to get to Christ, and they can't get to Christ, so I'm filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. That doesn't mean something's lacking in what Christ did. It simply means that people are trying to persecute Christ, and in doing so, they're going after Paul. So how you treat Paul is how you treat Christ. There's an identification so however God's people are treated is a statement about Christ himself. What you do with Christ's people says a lot about what you think of Christ. You understand that? This is so important, so critical for us to gather, to, to understand, because how you treat fellow believers and how you treat the messengers of God, how you treat God's people is a window into what we think about Jesus himself. One writer says, it is those who recognize such authority in the disciples who will welcome them. Just as it is those who recognize Jesus as God's representative who will welcome him. The unspoken corollary is that those who reject the disciples on their mission are guilty of a far graver fault than merely lack of hospitality to a fellow human being. They're rejecting God. How God's people are treated is how Christ is treated. So how do you treat God's people? How do you treat fellow believers? How do you handle those who bring the word? How do you handle those who speak the truth? How do you handle shepherds of the church? How do you handle fellow believers who are seeking to serve you and pour into you and care for you and minister to you? How do you care for them and how do you respond to them? It's a window into what you think about Jesus. Because whatever is done to Christ's people is done to Christ personally. So, 
Do you understand this principle? Do you understand this reality? There's a spiritual principle at operation here that Christ lives in his people. Christ identifies with his people. So you can't say, I'm going to treat Christ this way and his people another way because how you treat one is how you treat the other. So this is the principle number one. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. There's an identification there. Number two, we'll spend a little bit more time on this one. Number two is that believers are rewarded by Christ. Not only are you identified with Christ so that he lives in you, and he's identified himself with you and you with him, but number two, believers are rewarded by Christ. We don't talk a lot about rewards in the Christian life. But we come this morning to a couple verses where this is the theme. If you notice in verse 41, the word reward occurs twice. And in verse 42, the word reward occurs once. He's getting at the fact That how we treat fellow believers, how we treat one another, will be the basis of our rewards. So look at verse 41. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. So he's actually kind of saying the same thing that he said in verse 40. He said, how you treat me, or how you treat my disciples is how you treat me. There's a oneness, there's an identity there. Now he begins to kind of go down. Well, verse 41, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And not only that, he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So verse 41, you receive apostles or disciples. Verse 41, now you're receiving prophets, one who actually is a prophet in that day. It would have been one who spoke on behalf of God. And not only that, if you receive one who is a godly person, a righteous man or a righteous woman, there's reward for you as well. So notice what Jesus is getting at. He's talking about how you receive fellow believers, You receive, in that case, the disciples in our day, uh, fellow believers, prophets, righteous men and women. What happens when you receive them the way God would want you to receive them? Notice there's a reward. There's a reward here that is listed in, in this verse. We'll see it in verse 42 as well. There's a reward given to fellow believers. And at the core of our hearts, this is what Jesus is getting at. He wants us to understand how we treat one another. 
how we care for one another, how we minister to one another, how we serve one another, how we put the needs of others above ourselves, and how we come to serve them and care for them. It says a lot about how we think of Christ. So when you open your homes, it says something about what you think of Jesus. When you open your hearts to fellow believers, when you open your lives to fellow believers, what, what you're doing is giving a window into your love and your heart for Christ. And so what happens? What happens for those who are willing to do that? He says, you get a reward. You get rewards. You're blessed. When you see a fellow believer who's loving Christ and serving Christ and wanting to pour into that person and pour into others and bring the gospel and preach the truth, when, when that's happening, when that's taking place, and you're serving one another that way, and you're treating one another that way, there's a reward. In fact, notice what he says. Go to verse 41. This is really incredible. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Let that sink in. If you care for God's people and you receive them in the way God would want you to receive them, open hearts, open minds, open arms, embracing not only them but the message they're proclaiming when they're proclaiming the truth, it says there you actually get the exact same reward that the prophet gets. Wow. And notice the second thing in verse 41. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So you see a fellow believer who's a godly person. You love them. You receive them. You welcome them. You embrace not only them, but the message they're proclaiming as it's consistent with truth. Then you get the exact same reward in heaven that they get. Does that tell you something? that tell you something about how we should treat one another and how we should care for God's servants and God's people? One writer says, to receive such a servant is to put oneself in the position of receiving the same reward as the person received. This is incredible. You see what this does? It destroys the mentality that if you're going to be useful to the kingdom, you have to be some high-ranking Christian who's got a platform, who's got an audience, who's made a name for himself. And if you think that those are the only people that matter to God, you're thinking wrong. How you serve fellow believers matters. What you do for them matters. How you receive them matters matters. There are rewards given that are in equality with the same rewards of the very messengers themselves. That's phenomenal. It comes down to a matter of which rewards are you living for? Do you want rewards in this life or do you want rewards in the next life? Go back to Matthew chapter 5 for just a moment. I want you to see that he's already, Jesus has already introduced this concept of rewards. I want you to come over to Matthew chapter 5 verse 12. This is not the first time in Matthew 10 that he's been speaking about rewards. Matthew chapter 5, speaking about persecution in verses 10 and 11. Notice verse 12. He says, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. Great. You're persecuted. You're opposed. You face hostility in this world. There's going to be great rewards for you in heaven. Come over to chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, confronting the Pharisees. He says, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. You want applause in this life today? That's your reward. That's all you get. 
Come down to verse 5. When you pray, chapter 6, verse 5, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may, have seen, they may be seen by men. Surely I say to you, they have their reward in full. You want to pray? And you want people to pat yourselves on the back? That's your reward. That's all you get. Come down to verse 16. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. You want to fast and have people will be impressed? That's all your reward. That's all you get. Go back to Matthew chapter 10. You see, he's already been talking about rewards. And so how and for what rewards are you living for? You want the world to pat you on the back? You want the world to say how great you are? You're looking for something in this world that makes you feel good as if you're accomplished? No, Matthew chapter 10, verse 41, he says, how you receive one another is the basis of some of your rewards. It's tremendous. This is is so critical. Listen, here's the implication of this. God keeps track. He keeps track of every little thing that you do in service to him as it meets the need of fellow believers. He's watching, he's seeing, he's taking note, he's keeping a track, a record of it, he's keeping accounts of it, he's keeping records of all the ways that you serve his people. That ought to encourage your heart. You don't have to have a platform, you don't have to have a name, you don't have to have some a great ministry where everyone around the world knows your name. None of that is important. All you have to do is to faithfully serve the Lord and serve his people, and God is watching everything you do. When you send that note card in the mail because you know someone's struggling, he knows that. When you send a text, hey, I'm just thinking of you, I'm praying for you, I just want to encourage your heart today, he knows that. You take a meal to someone's house uh, because you know that it's been a rough week and you just want to encourage them. He knows that. He's keeping track of those things. He's keeping a record of those things. You see what this does? You don't have to sit and wonder, you know, I wonder if God even knew I did this. I wonder if he even cares I did this. Of course he does. Of course he cares. Of course he knows. And he's taking it all into consideration, and he's taking it all into account so that one day he can reward you for your faithful service, not only to him, but to his people. Listen to Hebrews 6.10. Write this down. Such a great encouragement. If you're, if you're a person who struggles a little bit with this, listen to this verse. God is not unjust. Hebrews 6.10. God is not unjust so as to forget your work and love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. He doesn't forget doesn't escape his attention. It's not off his radar. He knows every phone call you make, every note you send, every word of encouragement you give. He's keeping track of all of those things so that you can be rewarded and cast that crown back at his feet. So do you see the progression You receive apostles or disciples. You receive prophets. You receive righteous people. There's one other level. Notice verse 42. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. He's talking now about little ones. Some people think that's referring to children. He's not referring to children there. He's actually referring to just the normal, common Christian who's known to nobody, which is pretty much all of us. Those are the little ones. 
new believers who are still untaught and stumbling along in their new life as a Christian, lifelong believers who've served faithfully in obscurity for decades with no recognition, no honor, no awareness of their service, anyone in between, it doesn't matter, the lowliest, if there is such a thing, and there really isn't in the economy of Christ, the lowliest, most seemingly insignificant unimportant disciple, those little ones, when they do something as small as bringing a cup of cold water to someone who's in need of it, he sees it. Put yourself in that day. No refrigeration. It's hot. It's arid. Your throat is just dry. And some fellow believer comes up to you and from a cold spring has just grabbed a little cup of water and they've given it to you to slake your thirst. That tastes so good. A simple, small, little act And God knows. And God records that. One writer says, Jesus is not speaking of a small service rendered to a great person, but of a small service rendered to a small person. Even the smallest things you do even the tiniest ways you encourage fellow believers gets recorded in heaven. To the point that, notice what it says at the end of verse 42, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. God takes note of it. He keeps track of it. He knows it. He he records it. It's detected by the one who keeps accounts. And so even the simplest, smallest act of humility and kindness given to the simplest disciple doesn't go unnoticed by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So even these little ones... Even these seemingly unimportant disciples, these unimportant believers who are doing something to serve the kingdom by ministering to fellow believers, even they get a reward in heaven. You say, they didn't have a platform. That's okay. They didn't have a pulpit. Who cares? They didn't have a worldwide radio ministry. It doesn't matter. They faithfully serve God's people. Turn over to Matthew 25. Let me show you an example of this. The reason this is important is because it's actual service to Christ himself. And this is the point that Jesus is driving home here in Matthew chapter 10. He wants them to understand that how you serve fellow believers is actual ministry to Jesus himself. And in Matthew 25 we see this clearly explained starting in verse 31. This is the judgment of the nations. Let me just read this. Listen carefully. But when the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, you will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Here's the picture. There's coming a day when there's going to be a judgment of nations at the end of the tribulation before the thousand-year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He's going to return and he's going to separate sheep from goats, believers from unbelievers. And how do you know who goes in what category? Verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom 
prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteous are going to answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least, of them, you did it to me. Isn't that good? How do you know who's a believer? On the basis of how they treat other believers and what they do when they see fellow believers in need. That doesn't mean that's how you're saved, but it's an evidence of the fact that you are saved. Notice the opposite, verse 41, then he will say also to those on his left, depart from me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they themselves will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it. To one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You see what Jesus is doing? He is comparing service to fellow believers to service to him. How you serve fellow believers is an indicator of your service to Christ. Such that anything given to Jesus' little ones is regarded by Jesus as if given to Christ himself. You see his point? However you treat the people in this room, However you treat fellow believers in your life, whatever you do to them, whatever you do for them, that, that's an indicator of what you think about Jesus himself. And when you treat fellow believers with care, you're going to be richly rewarded. You are. You're going to be given a heavenly spiritual reward because you're actually serving Jesus. So, what's the point? You don't have to have a pulpit. You can just faithfully serve your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and, and you can know that the reward that you're going to receive is as great as the one who stands in a pulpit every Sunday. You don't have to go to the mission field. But you can hold the rope for those who do. And you can pray for them and you can give to them. I just saw Brian Twombly Sunday night. I was in Florida I was at graduation. I had a, just a couple minutes. I got to see him, and I said, Brother, we love you at Maranatha. We care for you. We can't go, but you're going. We go with you. We're praying for you. We're holding the rope with you. And he took out his cell phone, and he showed me a picture of the reception that his church had just given him that day with a picture of a banner that says, We're holding the rope for you. Most of us aren't going to go to the mission field. But you can pray. You can give. You can serve. You serve in the nursery. God knows. You pour into those little kids in children's church and junior church. God knows. You can't do any of that. Can you pray? I have a feeling there's going to be some pretty significant rewards given to people in heaven 
because all they could do is be at home and pray for God's people. They can't get out. They can't actively serve in ministry. But they can do what they can do. And the Lord knows. And he watches and he sees and he keeps account. And one day you'll receive your reward. It's tremendous. This ought to encourage your hearts. This ought to stimulate your ministry to others. This ought to give you a deep love for the saints. This ought to drive deep into your heart a a passion to meet the needs of those sitting around you and to love them because they're identified with, with Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these precious realities. Thank you for the fact, Lord, that you've given us these sweet truths to remind us that no service goes unnoticed by you. We thank you, Lord, that even in those small acts, those small ways that we show love to our brothers and sisters in Christ, even in that, you take note and you know and you record and one day all things will be made known and rewards will be given. Rewards that we will ultimately cast back at your feet for your glory and your honor. So help us, Lord, to serve with that heart. Help us show our affection for our Savior in the way that we care for and minister to the needs of those around us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Matt George is going to come up here. Bob Scott's going to come up here. We are leaving in 25 minutes. We are on our way to Detroit to catch an airplane this afternoon. So um, Bob's going to tell you a little bit. Matt's going to introduce this, and then I think you're going to pray for us. Take a few minutes and let everybody know what you'll be doing in Finland with Mishka. Yeah, it won't be a few minutes, but uh, (laughs) we can pray that we get to the airport on time. And uh, we're leaving for Detroit here very shortly. Uh, But we'll be, Miska is uh, doing a pastoral training center with the hopes of uh, actually starting a seminary. So Todd and I are going, in in the course of uh, four days, we're going to be teaching through the pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. So we have uh, a lot of hours ahead of us of of teaching. So you can pray for endurance and wisdom. And uh, it's a lot of uh, personal interaction with these men as well. Uh, and so we hope to just be a blessing to them. So we'll be gone for about 10 days and uh, should be back um, and ready to go here uh, in about a week and a half. So we really appreciate your prayers and uh, for safety to get over there and then just to be a blessing to the to the church there in Finland. So flight departs about 3.55 today, right, just before 4? All goes well. And you arrive back on June 6th. June 6th, right? sometime. And, yeah. and how many students does he currently have that know. he's teaching? No, no, okay. Know. All right. Well, we just want to just spend some time and just pray and commit these uh, men to the Lord as they travel to Finland. And so just uh, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for uh, the privilege that uh, Todd and Bob have of traveling to Finland for a week and a half here uh, to work alongside Mishka in training uh, young men there for the ministry. And Lord, I just pray that you would watch over them as they travel, that you would provide protection, that they would arrive safely and be able to return safely. Uh, But then while they're there, Lord, we pray especially that you would give them uh, just clarity in their teaching as they work through the pastoral epistles with these students, that they would be able to impart uh, wisdom to these uh, young men who are training that you would use them to faithfully uh, train young men who will shepherd the church in Finland. And we pray to that end, Lord, that you would strengthen and that you would grow the church there, that you would bring uh, souls to Christ uh, through the ministry of your word in local churches there in Finland. Just pray also that they would be just a rich blessing to Mishka and his family while they're there, and that we would just be able to tighten uh, and strengthen those bonds that we already have with them. 
And just pray also for, uh, for their families uh, remaining here as they uh, care for the children and just take care of things here. Just pray that you would uphold them, help us to come alongside and help in any way we can to serve them uh, while Todd and Bob are, are gone. And so we just uh, commit them into your hands, Lord. And we pray that uh, you would use this time to bless uh, the believers and students in Finland. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for praying for us. Uh, we'd love to greet you after our service. There'll be a short little reception at the base of the stairs in the library for new. If you need prayer, uh, we'd love to serve you in any way that we can. There's no classes today because of uh, Memorial Day. So just enjoy some great, great fellowship, and we'll see you next Sunday. You're dismissed.